Ladies and gentlemen, Una Kravitz. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for that glamorous introduction. So we've heard a lot of really cool things about CSS today, and I love what the web can do. Some of those things are with blend modes and filters, and I'm going to talk about that right now with you all. So blend modes are really cool because you can do cool things like integrating SAS and the random function to get generative art like this, like this Boca portrait. Every time you refresh that CSS, the SAS, the dots will change color and position and size. You can do things like this, like playing around. I called this one Accidental Cool Effect 2. Good at naming things. Um, but it's just a blend of, no pun intended, blend modes and gradients and seeing how things interact with each other. Since it's the web, you can do things like this, infrared effects. You don't need a special lens, have a nice camera, go out into the real world. You can just do this in your browser. You can do this with CSS, you can do this with SVG. You don't have to leave the leisure of your own sofas. And you can create 3D effects. Just when you know how these blend modes interact, you can use lighten and darken to provide values in certain pixels. And since it's the web, we can animate them. We can create 3D movies if we really wanted to get into it by using blend modes and filters online. And this stuff is really cool. If you want to learn more about any of those demos, you can go to artthewebcom I will share these links at the end. Um, and there are some blogs there that go through how to do some of these effects. But sometimes when I get really excited about this stuff, I get this reaction. This woman is saying, do you make money from your art? And this boy is saying yes. And she says, really? And then this is me. <laughs> Sad life. So as, as you heard, my name is Yuna. That's me on the internet, on GitHub, on Twitter, et cetera. Feel free to tweet at me, ask me questions. I'm a UI engineer at DigitalOcean. I also started a couple of SaaS meetups, SaaS like the CSS preprocessor. I started the one in DC, then I moved to Austin, Texas, where I started the Austin SaaS meetup. I live nowhere now, so I'm kind of just floating. Um, and I also co-host a podcast called Tools Day. It's like 20 to 30 minutes-ish about tech tools, tips and tricks on Tuesdays at 2. So like I said, I want to show that blend modes are not this gr like glamorous, extravagant thing. They can be very practical as well. And we're going to actually merge these two and look at how we can use them in our UIs. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is CSS filters. And I like to start with this because they are the easiest way to use these effects in your UIs. They're basically one line of code, maybe two, if you need that WebKit prefix. So with CSS filters, we have a couple of options. We have 10 to be exact, and these are the options that you have. Um, I'll just show them all. I don't have to go through them individually because you can sort of figure out how they work by experimentation. Um, so with these filters, all you need is to have one CSS property, which is filter, and you need that WebKit prefix, or you can use auto prefixer, um, to apply a variety of effects. And you can use these together, combined in a space-separated list. So you could have both brightness affected and contrast and hue rotate. And they take a few different um, operations, like hue rotate is in degrees. Brightness, if it's less than one, it'll actually darken the image. Um, there's saturate, which kind of goes up to an infinite number. So you can play around with these drop shadow as an argument list. And the, the support is pretty good in browsers today. Um, pretty much every browser except for IE supports some sort of filter. And it's also not bad to use because you're just applying a lens on top of an image. So your content is always going to be sent. This can be used with progressive enhancement. If you want to use it in IE 6 through 9, not 10, um, you can polyfill it with SVG filters or DirectX filters. And that is because CSS filters are a more optimized version of SVG filters that browsers have implemented as sort of a shortcut for these SVG filters. And we'll get into those filter effects later. So here's an example of just a really easy use of this. It's a blog post that I wrote. I, I drew these illustrations in this app called Paper on my iPad, right? So it looks like they're white, they blend in with the background, but if you know this app, you'll know that the default is this gray sort of texture. I'm not sure if you can see on there, but there's an outline. They don't flow into the document well. There's a difference there. But instead of opening these images individually in Photoshop, editing them, exporting them, putting them back in my browser, I can use one line of code that says to increase the brightness or to increase the contrast, and that gray color is faded out. So it saves a lot of steps of process and work, and I can do this directly in my browser to get the effect I want in the intended medium that I'm presenting. 
Here's another example of a common UI element that you see online on the Dolce Gabbana website. So how many of you have seen like sidebar menus where you click, it defocuses the page? You're all lying. None of you have seen this. OK, most of you have. Um, and so what they're doing here is they're applying a div. They have this opacity on it, but it's black with like 0.5 opacity that they're applying here. But filters make this much more powerful. So what I'm showing here is the backdrop filter. And with backdrop filter, we can not only affect this, we can use that div and then play with the blur. So you're applying this filter to the blur behind that div, any element that is behind it on the page. Um, since it is space separated, we can add on to this. So what we can do is then apply a hue rotate and play with the different filters that we have available to us. It provides for a lot more flexibility. And these CSS filters are animatable because they have properties in between 0 and 1 or whatever their values are. So these are all animatable. So we can also make it brighter. And since we can make it brighter, that means that we can also make it darker. And if we make it darker, we don't even need that background color. We can take that line out. And we have all this created in one line of code. This is the power of CSS today. Well, I say today in like a very uh, broad sense, because here's the browser support. But there's good news. Um, the good news is that there are workarounds to this. So this is an example in CodePen. Um, as you can see, it's working great. What they're doing here is a little hack called like the fixed background hack, and it works like this. Um, so say you have a text element, this element with this like writing on it and this background, this whole page. What you do is you apply the same background image to that text element and the page itself. And you make that a fixed background, so they're both not moving. Um, and you make that a position cover, so it takes the entire width of the document and fits it accordingly. Now we can apply filters, we can lighten it, we can blur it to make that text more legible, but continue to scroll. So when we move around this page, since it's a fixed background, we're revealing different parts of that image. The background itself is not moving. Neither of the backgrounds are moving, but we are revealing different parts of it because it's a fixed background. So you can recreate this today in CSS3. We can also do things like revealing elements. Does anybody want to take a guess at what this is? I heard, I heard rumblings of Pokemon. It is. They're everywhere. It's an Eevee. Um, and so we can also do the opposite of that and sort of make text more legible and hover with these same concepts. So here's just an example of all the different things that we can do, um, various effects. The cool thing about these effects is for hover and focus states, we don't have to send another request to the user with this alternate image. We can just apply it on the graphic itself. So you're saving your users a network request by providing this as just a piece of CSS code that they can implement, have the browser run instead of send them another file. So it could improve performance in that aspect. All right, so we talked about filters. I told you that was short. The real crux of this is blend modes and then the filter effects in SVG. And blend modes are really exciting because they are so powerful. There are a lot more of them than the filter effects. Here are your options. So they come in a couple of groups. We have darken, multiply, and color burn as a group that darkens your image, uh, light and screen and color dodge. There's overlay, soft light, and hard light. Difference and exclusion are a little bit different. And then there's hue, saturation, color, and luminosity. These are all sort of within the same group. And the support is a little bit worse than CSS filters, but it's still pretty strongly supported in most modern browsers. Unfortunately, Edge isn't supporting them yet, but I'm really hoping that they will consider that soon. There are two types of ways to blend your images. There is the background blend mode, and then there's the mixed blend mode. They both have very similar uh, browser performance abilities. Um, but the difference is that with background blend mode, you're only blending images that are within a single element. So this means that you have an element that has multiple backgrounds. You can isolate that and apply the blend modes to the backgrounds within that element itself. With mixed blend mode, you're applying the blend mode to anything on the page that's within the same composite of the div. So if you have a body tag and a section, um, you can mix any of those elements as they interact and scroll, and we'll see some of those. There's a polyfill for background blend mode, and you can polyfill that with Canvas if you want to. Uh, with mixed blend mode, there's not a polyfill yet. But honestly, my recommendation is if you need to polyfill these things, it's probably not worth it, because that's additional code they've sent to your users. It's still an experimental stage. Um, so a lot of things here are sort of like progressive enhancement. 
So the first blend mode I want to talk about is Multiply, and this is probably the most common blend mode that you'll see. Um, and Multiply works very simply. It takes your active layer's pixels, and it literally multiplies their value by the background layer pixels. It's like a transparency. So if, you're, if you have like an overhead projector and you have two sheets that are transparent, any dark values won't shine through. You'll have that dark value. Any darkish values makes the darkish value will be even darker. Uh, light values will shine through. So as you can see here, we're actually creating new colors when you mix these um, values together. These blues and yellows turn green. And it works just like a transparency. I think it adds a lot more depth to the image, and you can see a lot more of the detail in this CSS background. You can use it to unify your websites. Um, here's an example that I was pretty shocked to find this yellow is somewhat legible. Like, the white is legible in the yellow. Um, but what they did is they provided this unified element by multiplying on the page and presenting this aesthetic. And something like unique, something that you don't see on the web today. I think it, it provides for a nice visual. Here's another example. And what I like about this is it moves with you. So this is last year's XOXO um, Festival's website. And you can see that this is live code. You can't do this in Photoshop. It's something that you can only do in your browser. The CSS Comp website, which is, this is coming up next week, um, also use this, this blend mode on their website. What they did is they combined it with SVG and gradients. So the first time we went to this website, I think they took it off for, probably for performance reasons, but these SVG little blobs like slowly moved around the page so you could see that it was really interactive and live and provided a really nice effect on top of videos, etc. So really cool to see how these things are slowly making their way out on the web. And what you can do with these blend modes is compositions like this which you weren't able to do earlier. Like, you would have to make this a JPEG or export it, et cetera. But now we can use native elements in the browser and use these blend modes, have it be search engine friendly, have it be a part of your UI, have it be accessible, because now it's legible by the browser itself and by the DOM, because we're using blend modes. This is something that was just talked about um, by Espen. And it's just that we need to stop getting our inspiration for websites from other websites. It's something that we see a lot. We go on like awards.com or see what other people have done. It provides all of our websites to start looking the same. And there's so much more out there. There's architecture and there's fashion design and there's illustration, there's children's toys. We can find inspiration in any of these things and bring that into the web. I totally stole the slide from Espen who spoke right before me, but I loved it. It's a great, great quote by Andy Clark about it. Like this is how I feel internally. I'm sure that's how you all feel as well. So as another example of this, um, this is a wine label, but now with these blend modes, you can apply these effects to this text, this SVG image, and really make it legible and like, readable by the browser. So it's cool how this is becoming more and more native as a part of our design. It's how we're able to design directly in the browser. We don't need an extra step of opening Photoshop, making it unreadable to the browser. We can just do it right there. The next blend mode I want to talk about is screen. Um, and screen works as the exact opposite of multiply. So we're going to be taking inverses. And the way that you take an inverse is you subtract that value from 1. And this is what that looks like. So we are taking the inverse of the active layer's luminosity value, multiplying it by the inverse of the background layer's luminosity value, and then inverting that. So it's like multiplying the light pixels in a way. The other thing about blend modes is that you can use them with various elements. Um, here's a portrait that I'm going to be using as an example. And let's apply some snow because why not? Um, so what we can do, since this is just in the browser, is we can apply screen and create these really interactive elements that we're blending on the page ourselves. We can add some filters and make it blurry. We can increase the brightness. We can make it darker, any of those things. And this is all something that your user can interact with. And it's all because we're using the web, just doing it dynamically. It's a really powerful visual rendering engine. Here's another example of that, again, and this is an example of this video that we have composed here live, but just as a GIF. And as you can see, it's really janky. Um, you can see a lot of pixelation in there. It's not that great. But the most surprising thing is when you look at the sizes of these. So this image, this portrait, is pretty big because I have it as a presentation image. The video is pretty big. Um, those together with the blend modes is 3.6 megabytes. All right, I get it. You're not going to put this online, but it is in a presentation. And it is the example here. But when we compare that to the GIF, it's much smaller. 
So if you use these in the right way, if you're using with performant images and video, you can use these blend modes to multiply those together and make it a little bit more performant for your user and what they're getting on their site. I love this example of a screen because it was just a really practical UI element. You can do this with a few circles and SVGs, and it was a really clever way um, that Jan used this as an essential element in design. And just found this on Dribble. A lot of great inspirations on there. All right, so let's talk about Lighten, which is probably my favorite blend mode. Um, Lighten is used in this example as a gradient over this image of Emma Watson. And um, blend modes are really good because they can provide unity throughout your site. So what we're seeing here is this gray to blue gradient applied on top. We're losing some of those details in the shadow here around the lips and around like the finger area. Um, and that's because we have a darker color applied in the Lighten blend mode. So what happens when we're using Lighten? This is what happens. So say we want to lighten this pink color by this blue shade. We get this purple value like that you can see right through here. And the math is pretty simple if we look at the RGB values themselves. Um, let's take a look. So if you think about it, the lightest RGB value that we have is white. Would you agree? 255, 255, 255. And black is 000. So if we compare those values, 190 or 40 on the red channel, which one's lighter? It's 190. Uh, with green, 25 or 160? It's 160. And then the same for the blue channels. So that's how we get our value that we're getting out of that calculation in the light and blend mode. Here's an example of using that effect with a background blend mode. Um, here I'm lightening it with a background blend mode. I have multiple backgrounds here. And it's an example of how you can use dev tools to your advantage. Dev tools are really powerful today. You have these palettes, you have like a whole color wheel accessible to you. You can do your designing in the browser and prototyping in the browser um, right there, pair design, pair develop, and see what it looks like. An uh, example that I found online as well is this, which shows you how powerful this is. So here's this black and white, right, which is fine, so nice composition. But when you apply a gradient and a blend mode, it really brings it to life. And it's a simple step of using a few lines of CSS, a few colors, and a gradient um, to really bring compositions to life and make them much more unique. So next, I want to talk about the color group. Um, and to do this, I will show you with this dog. I'm going to overlap and then apply color. So what the color blend mode is doing is it's taking the hue value and the saturation value of the active layer, so in this case, it's that rainbow, and applying that to the luminosity value of the dog behind it. That means that the dog could be completely black and white and have no color on it, and it would look exactly the same, because it's taking the hue and saturation from the color above it. And this kind of explains it a little bit more, this wheel. Um, if you think about it, the hue is what um, area of the color wheel it is, sort of. Saturation is how far away that color is from 50% gray, and the luminosity is the dark to light level. These are also individual blend modes. So you can use something's hue, saturation, or luminosity and blend that onto the layer behind it. Color is unique because it uses two of these, which is the hue and the saturation. Here's an example of something you can do there. Um, a gradient that goes from blue to yellow just really creates a unity on this page. That image can be sent as a black and white image, which saves your user a bit of memory, since black and white JPEGs are going to have less data on them than a color JPEG. So that's an idea there for a little bit more performance. Um, and you can also use them to unify a theme. So here's a conference I spoke at earlier this year, and they use this like purple aesthetic on all their images throughout their site. I was browsing this website and looking through what the talks are, like who the speakers are, just you know, cruising along. Um, and everything was fine. And then I noticed that one of the speakers was sort of missing the effect that was applied to it. And it's because what they had to do is take these photos, edit them in Photoshop individually, resave them. You don't see what the name is if you're just looking at the code, um, and then stick it back into the website. But if we use blend modes or filters, we don't have to do this. So what we could do is, again, open up our handy dandy dev tools, apply a pseudo element. So here I have an after pseudo element. And on that after pseudo element, I'm applying the color that I'm going to blend. And there I can edit the color, change the color, whatever I want to do. Um, and I'm using that um, light and blend mode again here. So there it's mixing onto the page. I'm using the color blend mode, sorry. So it's taking the saturation and the hue of that color and it's blending it onto the image behind it. So this works really well, 
But if you have to support browsers that aren't accepting blend modes, we can also do a little hack and twist around the other way. So what we can do is use a before pseudo element, put the element behind the photo, and then use the luminosity blend mode of the photo. So now what we're doing is we're saying we want to take the darkness and lightness value of this photograph, but mix it on top of the hue and saturation of the element behind it. So if it's a solid color, we're applying the same effect, and if the browser doesn't support blend modes, we'll still see the image. They'll have a div behind it, but you won't see that div with that color applied. So if you do have to support browsers, there are workarounds if you think about it in a really progressively enhanced way and test with different browsers. So you don't want to be blocking your content. This isn't a problem for filters because you're not applying any extra elements, but it could be a problem for blend modes. So embrace the cascade. Uh, this is like a really big plus of using CSS as your design tool. What you can do if you have an idea in mind then is start to take what exists and sort of conform it to that. So I, I went ahead and I built this library figuring out how to recreate all these Instagram filters in CSS. Um, so here's an example of toaster, there's moon here, um, and they all use a variety of filters and blend modes, and gradients, because what gradients allow you to do is apply multiple colors on a single plane. So there are a couple of examples here, um, but if you want to see more, you can go to this website. It's an open source project taking contributions, and it's just una.im slash cssgram. Um, seeing the variety there, so like I said, the filters are animatable, the SVG um, filter effects aren't, so there's like a little bit of a weirdness there on hover, you'll see a little bit of animation, and the blend modes aren't animatable either. But this is not the only thing that's out there. Um, since that launch, there's also CSSGO, which is Visco Cam, and all of those filters applied. And then there's this project, which is colofilter.css, that I really like, because it's super colorful. Um, and this is by Lucky VJ. So there's the URL. I know that's going to be hard to, to like, take note really quick, so I'm going to share these links at the end. Um, but I really like the gradients at the bottom of this. The idea is that you can recreate these filters, get from point A to point B in CSS. The next blend mode I want to talk about is overlay. And overlay is interesting because it uses a variety of blend modes. So what this uses is both the screen and the multiply blend mode at half strength. So the screen blend mode is applied in the active layers, and multiply is on the darker layers here, the darker pixels. Um, and this border here is applied as an overlay. It's not like a white thing that's just laying on your page. It actually takes the pixels and applies a much more subtle, um, subtle overlay to them because it is overlaying it, it's not just applying it at an opacity. If we had a color here, like a blue color, um, you would see that it's creating more of a brown shade within that darker value and maybe more of an orangey green shade as it blends in um, the, topper, the upper part of this image. Here's another example of overlay. What I like about this is it shows the movement of the web. That's really where the strength of these lies. There's a really cool example from vr-sessions.com. All of these are little overlay SVG things that um, interact with photographs on the web. I want to see more of this. Here's another great example from a website that is pretty well known, and that's Everlane. So everlane.com did this. They used an overlay on the text that interacted with this image behind it. So you had this model walking across the stage. Those text elements are blending in. It's still legible. It's still highlightable. It's still search engine readable. Um, but it's a really unique view. And here's difference. So it's a completely different look. If I apply difference on top of it, you get this white instead of the blending of that dark color on the dark. It just creates the total opposite of what we see with overlay. So it's, it's awesome to see that these like, bigger brands are experimenting with these things in the web. And again, if your browser doesn't support it, you'll just see the white text on that video. So speaking of difference, um, we're going to talk about the difference blend mode. Let me find my mouse. Woo! Um, so what difference does is it takes these two images and it looks at the difference between them by subtracting the pixels. Um, and closer pixels here will turn black. If we're using exclusion, then pixels that are similar will turn gray. So it allows us to like, sort of cheat on these kids' games. It works like this. You can see the difference between them by layering it. It's exactly how it works. Difference was originally used to line up transparencies when you had the RGBA channels with images and see if you had any mistakes there. So when I first talked about this, um, I was speaking to Sarah Drasner, and she came up with this idea of like, oh, well, with difference, then we can do visual regression testing. This is something that Anna talked about in her talk earlier. 
It's a great thing to do when you're using a when you're creating a style guide or you're creating some sort of like visual unity. You want to make sure that you're not breaking the rest of your page. And you can do this with blend modes. So in one line of code, you can apply two images and see the difference between them, right? So then I took that idea and I thought, well, why not make this something live that people can use? So this is called Diffy. It's Diffy.me, um, and you can see visual diffs and apply them and see the changes directly on the web just by using a single line of code. These blend modes. And this works behind firewalls, et cetera, because it has access to whatever you have access to. So if you want to check something like local versus something that's live, it's a great tool for just seeing visual regression in your production or your development environments. All right, so uh, blend modes are pretty cool. But let's go back to filter effects. Um, SVG filter effects are a little different than the CSS ones. They're much more powerful. Uh, like I said, the CSS filters are sort of more optimized shortcuts to these. So we're going to kind of get a little nerdy here and like figure out how we can make pretty cool customized filters. But before we get into SVG filter effects, I want to talk about your health because I care about you. This is a short video. It's about two and a half minutes. Um, it talks about blue light. The impact of screens on sleep. You know, people are exposing their eyes to this stream of photons from these objects that basically tells your brain, stay awake, it's not time to go to sleep yet. So it's 10 p.m., it's 11 p.m., it's 12 p.m., you're checking for email, you're looking for text, you're doing all these things. That light beams in you. It tells your brain, don't secrete melatonin yet, it's not time for sleep and you're up at 12.30, you're up at 1, you're checking some more because you're up after all, why shouldn't you check? Now, you go to bed at 1, you wake up at 6 to get ready for work, that's five hours of sleep. We now know that what sleep is likely doing is allowing your active neurons to rest, which is fine, but more than that, the supportive cells, called glial cells, are now cleaning up the toxins that the neurons produce. And if you don't get from seven to nine hours of sleep, you just get five, the toxins remain there for over 95% of people. There are a small percent of people who are genetically different, they don't need that much sleep, but for the vast majority of us, we need seven to nine hours of sleep. So even though it's like a badge of courage, I only had three hours of sleep last night and I'm working today, it makes your attention falter, your memory is impaired, your ability to think through problems is challenged. Your insulin, even, that helps regulate your metabolism is turned upside down so you're more likely to gain weight from what you eat and eat more. And then, if that weren't enough, it's actually toxic to the connections in your cells. So, in your brain. So what you want to do is prioritize sleep. Shut off your screens, let's say by 9 p.m. Give yourself an hour at least before you're going to bed and keep those screens off. It's a serious, serious problem for everyone and we can do something about it by actually actively deciding that's what we're going to do is take care of this aspect of the digital domain. All right, science class is over. Um, so, yeah, who wants to take a nap now? That is exactly why we have things like Flux. Have you all heard of this app, Flux? Yeah. yeah. Does, does anyone use it here? Okay, so more of you use Flux than have seen a pop-out menu with a focus. That's pretty impressive. Um, so what Flux does is exactly this, prevents these blue sort of colors that are going into your eyes at night, affecting your sleep, et cetera. Um, and we can also fix this terrible, terrible problem by creating our own SVG filters. So if we could take something like this image, open it in a photo editing program, apply RGBA channel alterations, then we can do this in SVG. Pretty much anything that we can imagine we can translate. And the support is pretty good. It works even in Internet Explorer. It works across browsers, um, SVG filters. They go back a little ways, so um, the availability is there. And I'm going to show you two specific ways. Um, the first is called FE component transfer. And this is really powerful because it allows for per channel manipulation. This is something that we can't do with blend modes. This is something that was sort of difficult when I was making a CSS gram because I couldn't affect just the red or the blue channel. But with SVG filters, you have this capability. 
So within FE component transfer, it composes FE function R, G, B, and A, which is, as you guessed it, the various channel values that we have available to us on photos. And there are a couple of different types of ways to implement this. Uh, we're going to be focusing on linear and gamma. But there's also discrete and table as options available to you. So with linear, now it's time for math class. It's went from science to math. Um, it's time to remember, you know, like y equals mx plus b. This is your slope-intercept form. These are the values that you have available to you in a linear transformation of your pixel values in any channel. So this is kind of what it looks like. And in code, within SVG code, you see that you have this FE component transfer composing a, an FE function. So this is the green channel here. We have type linear and slope and intercept are the two values we have available to us. The next thing I want to talk about is gamma. Um, and gamma sort of works like this. This is an example on the luminosity channel, which is probably the most common channel that you'll see this used in. And we use gamma correction because the way that our eyes see the world, the way that your camera sees the world, and the way that your computer screen sees the world are three different things, right? So if you're hanging out with your friend and you're like hiking in the woods, and there's like a really nice picture of like the sun shining through trees behind them, and like, wait, stop, I want to take a picture of you. You take the picture, and they're just like black. They're like a black outline because the sun is too bright. They're very backlit. But to your own eyes, you can make that correction. You can see their features. You can see their eyes. You can see them talking to you. Your camera can't see this. So with this gamma correction, it allows us to alter the pixels intermediate of the black and white values and lighten that image. You can apply this in any channel. So gamma, in this case, essentially means that we're going to be creating a curve. And when you're doing that, you have amplitude, exponent, and offset as possibilities for you to use with SVG. So again, using FE component transfer, you're composing this red channel and applying that. So back to Flux. I'm going to show you how you can recreate Flux by creating your own custom filters. So this is the starting point, and we're going to get to here. We're just going to get rid of a little bit of that blue light um, and make it a little bit easier for our users to read our text and see our screens and not affect them as much. So start here with this image, take it into a photo editing program, and then see where we feel this should be. This is like not an exact science, just a demo. Um, so I think this looks pretty okay. Now I want to take this and transfer that into SVG code. So I just used these linear transformations here. I thought that they worked better since I wanted this thing that was a little bit more exact there. Um, and you see the red value, it's a linear transformation. The slope remains the same but it's up a little bit on that axis. So the intercept is going to be positive, it's 0.5. Uh, with the green, the intercept's at zero, but it has a bit greater of a slope there. And with blue, it's a negative intercept. So you can just directly transfer your graphs into SVG code for your custom filters. And then if we wanted to really make this a thing, we can use literally three lines of JavaScript um, and get the date, and then say if it's between 20 o'clock and five o'clock, then we're going to apply a class to the document. And then we can use that class to style our web page and apply the WebKit filter. So we apply that class. It's like flexible 1600K, like Kelvin for temperature. Um, and in this case, we're assuming that that URL of that SVG is on the page itself. So this means that you're inlining the SVG. You can also use an SVG that's independent, that's um, an external SVG. I'll put it in your like, image folder as like, a definition SVG um, and apply it that way. So we'll be doing like URL dot dot slash image slash SVG example dot SVG and then the hashtag for the ID of that filter. Um, be careful with this because you have to have it on the same domain as the site that you're serving or you will have cross origin reference issues, which I run into a few times. So it's just something that you have to be cognizant of when you're using SVG filters. So like I said, in one or two lines of code, one if you're using an auto prefixer, you can apply this in your CSS, and there you go. It goes from this to this, and here's another example. Um, the other thing that you could probably do in the future is use the ambient light queries that are written in the future spec, potentially, of CSS. Uh, so what that means is basically you'll be able to read the ambient light from a mobile device or your computer and apply these styles accordingly. So that was FE Composite. Now we're going to be talking about FE Color Matrix. Um, and FE Color Matrix kind of looks crazy at first, but if you understand what's going on, it's a lot easier. So a good example of this is sepia, because sepia is now a CSS filter. It's so common that that's why they turned it into one. So this is what it looks like in SVG. 
it just looks like just a bunch of numbers, like really weird decimals. And then in CSS, it's just a line of code. Why would I want to do that? Um, so the first thing to know about the FE color matrix in SVG is that these values correlate to 255, which is like your RGB channel values. So 255 out of 255 would be one, and that's why it's zero to one inclusive. Anything below that would be one of these decimal places. So you can do the math there. And it looks like this if we break it down. So we have this RGB and A channel, and then we get that plus a multiplier um, to get our final values. And that's how you have this five by four grid with this FE color matrix. You are applying this to the entire image. So it's not per channel per se, since you're applying an entire matrix to it, but it is a direct correlation to the individual channels that you can affect with this matrix. If we wanted to, for example, colorize our image to green, remove all the red, remove all the blue, but keep the luminosity the same, and also just colorize it green, we'll do this. We'll take away the red channel from the R1, we'll take away the blue on that third channel there, and it looks like this. Just totally green, remove the red and blue values. So you can really play this a lot on the web and sort of figure out what you want to do and how you get the visual effect that you're looking for. A great tool is this one by Kazkick. Um, you can just click and sort of figure out where these different values are doing um, just online. This again will be straight at the end, so you can have this value to take home, play with, see how F uh, SVG works with the FE color matrix. So a cool example I found using this um, was on CodePen. So here, somebody took it a step further. This is created by Jose Perez. And what he did was he created a function for you to then say, OK, I want color A. These are the RGB values for color A as the highlight, and color B to be the shadow. So let's recreate these duotone effects, because we can figure out how to apply those through the channels in SVG. And now we can just say with one line of code, apply these two colors as the highlight and the shadow. And what he's doing in this is he's creating a new color matrix every time. So dynamically generating a new FE color matrix, you're always going to have that same URL link, because the ID is not changing, but the values inside of it are changing. And we can really break this down and see how that process works. So what you're doing here is you're taking the red color, green colors, and blue colors, and on any of the channels, uh, his example is on the red channel, you are subtracting them and then dividing them by 255 to get that value. So R1 minus R2 over 255. And it goes all the way down, green 1 minus green 2, blue 1 minus blue 2, and then dividing them by 255 to get that 0 to 1 inclusive value. So then the second step is in the shadow, we're taking that second value, the shadow color, and applying that as the multiplier on every individual channel. And this allows for an even spread. Um, so you're taking the red, the green, the blue, and over 255 on that multiplier. We're going to be leaving alpha alone. That's just going to stay at 1. So if we wanted to do an example, if we wanted like a bright red highlight and a bright blue shadow, these are like pure pixel values. Um, the math is right here. It's 255 over 255. That gives you 1. Um, and then over on the shadow, on the blue side, you have negative 1 and 1 as the final matrix that you're getting here. So it looks like this. Uh, you can test it on this site. Um, so you can just say, like, I want these two colors, apply them as an FE color matrix. But again, this works in any of the channels. So this is the red channel. You can do the same thing on the green channel or the blue channel, just depending on what visual effect you're looking for. Um, there's this website by Ines Montani, and she did a really cool job of implementing this. So there's this duotone effect on all of the images, like the intro images on her blog that she applied throughout. And what she did was she used Jade. So um, she used Jade and she used Harp. And Harp is a static site processor that allows for you to have a data file. And in this data file, she's just saying, OK, I want this image, and I want these two colors to be applied to it. And it's dynamically creating these duotone effects with a combination of all these things. So here's image, here's colors, and it's just dynamic on the page as a UI element. And every time you're appending a new FE color matrix to that and applying that ID onto that image. So in review, there's a lot of stuff I went over here. Um, CSS is really awesome, I'd say, but it works. It's a thing to keep in mind. Um, don't do these things because browser support is not fully there yet. As you can see, um, if you have to support older browsers, I don't know if the polyfills are worth it per se. It's great for experimentation. Um, performance, this. Could alter performance? Well, it does a little bit by like 0.1 of a second. I did the research on this. 
Um, because what it does is you have to load the image and then you have to apply a paint on top of that. So you are having to have an additional rendering time for the browser. And you can't save your images too. So that's the thing to keep in mind. If you're applying a filter on the web, you can't save that personally because you're just going to get the original image. Filters and blend modes and FE filter effects are like a lens. This isn't like Canvas. With Canvas, you can save your images because you're actually altering the pixels themselves, which is why Canvas is a little bit slower than these. Um, but you can't save these down. And it also means that there's no thumbnail support. So if I wanted to share this on Twitter, I wouldn't have the effect applied to my image. You would just get the original image that you're sending to your users because Twitter can't read that that filter is applied on top of the image. But do try this because performance. Um, yeah, I just said don't try it because performance. But like I showed in a few examples, this could be performant when you're using interactions, when you're applying various things, especially with video and images. Um, flexibility allows for a lot of flexibility on your site. Again, with the interaction, the user can really experiment with that, like see how what the user is doing affects your page, etc. Um, consistency, so that cascade, you can just apply it through all your sites, uh, all your images with one line of code and just using a class name. Speed of prototyping, it's great for designing, like next to a developer, you know, pairing with them. Um, basically, it's good for creating your product in the medium that you're presenting, which is pretty important to do because you're going to have to test it anyway. Accessibility for more artistic designs. Uh, some of those examples that I showed allowed for some of those compositions to be readable by the browser, which means that they're accessible. It means that they're part of the DOMs, so they're readable, um, they're part, the search engines can look at them. It allows for us to push the web a little bit further. And then exploration, because this is all just getting started, and it's, it's a space that we need to explore. I love this site. Uh, it's called Evolution of the Web. It has to be updated, but it's a pretty cool visualization of browsers and capabilities of the web and different features that it's had. And I like to use this as a reference when I give this talk, because this is CSS animations. I know it's hard to see, but this is where CSS animations lies on this whole timeline of the web. And here is Flexbox. So Flexbox is even newer, but we see animations in Flexbox pretty regularly. They're pretty well supported. We see them all over now. Um, and then here, this tiny itty bitty thing is the filters. So it's like a baby. It's just getting started. And right now is the time to experiment and explore with them. The only way to push the web forward is to build something that pushes the web. And this is a great example of how we can make this spec better, make it more accessible, make it more performant with the browser. Like CSS filters, that is SVG filters, but more performant because people were using them. So be an explorer and art the web. Thank you. And there's the link. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Una Kravitz.